All right, guys. It is a dark, gloomy, gray Sunday morning here in the collapse of global industrial civilization and what may or may not be the end times. Here on this gloomy Sunday morning in the Catskill Mountains, that would be Sunday, June 16th, 2019. And uh, so the little dog has been barking all morning, waking up the neighborhoods. This mouthy little dog, while I have been trying to get together the combination <coughs> Doomsday Sermon of the Week for that other channel, and the Monday Chronicle of the Collapse, where, where some of you listening to this, this will be the second time this week, where I have turned to philosopher John Gray. And today, we are going to read from a book Sancho needs to read, The Silence of Animals. Shh. The Silence of Animals on Progress and Other Modern Myths. Okay, so uh, we're going to read a couple of selections about uh, progress and other myths. We're going to start with the essay, The Call of Progress, and maybe I'll have time to read the first half of his second essay. Okay, The Call of Progress, where he starts with a <clears throat> long quote from my hero, Joseph Conrad. So a lot of this he, he quotes from Conrad. <clears throat> Take it away, Joseph Conrad. Kaertz was hanging by a leather strap from the cross. He had evidently climbed the grave, which was high and narrow, and after tying the end of the strap to the arm, had swung himself off. His toes were only a couple of inches above the ground. His arms hung stiffly down. He seemed to be standing rigidly at attention, but with one purple cheek playfully posed on the shoulder, and irreverently he was putting out a swollen tongue at his managing director, close quote. The hanged man, <clears throat> this is back to John, the hanged man was one of a pair of traders sent by a Belgian corporation to a remote part of the Congo, 300 miles away from the nearest trading post. Most of their work was done by a, <coughs> a native interpreter who used a visit by some tribesmen to sell some of the outpost workers as slaves in exchange for ivory tusks. Initially shocked at being involved in slave trading, but finding the deal highly profitable, Kaertz and the other European, Carlier, accepted the trade. Having made the deal, they were left with little to occupy their time. They passed their days reading cheap novels and old newspapers extolling our colonial expansion and the merits of those who went about bringing light, faith, and commerce to the dark places of the earth. Reading these newspapers, Carlier and Kyertz began to think better of themselves. Yes. Over the next few months, they lost their habit of work. The steamer they were expecting did not arrive and their supplies began to run out. Quarreling over some lumps of sugar that Kaertz held in reserve, Carlier was killed. In desperation, Kaertz decided to kill himself too. As he was hanging himself on the cross, the steamer arrived. When the managing director disembarks, he finds himself face to face with the dead Kaertz. Joseph Conrad wrote the story, An Outpost of Progress, in 1896, and it is a story at least as ferocious and disabused as his later and better known novella, 
Heart of Darkness, which, you know, was adopted into uh, Apocalypse Now in the 1970s, Conrad describes how Kayertz, quote, sat by the corpse of Carlier thinking, thinking very actively, thinking very new thoughts. His old thoughts, his old thoughts, convictions, likes and dislikes, things he respected and things he abhorred appeared in their true light at last, appeared contemptible and childish, false and ridiculous. He reveled in his new wisdom while he sat by the man he had killed, close quote. But not all of Kayert's, his old convictions have vanished, and what he still believes in leads him to his death. Quote, quoting Conrad again, progress was calling Kayert's from the river. Progress and civilization and all the virtues. Society was calling to its accomplished child to come to be taken care of, to be instructed, mm -hmm. to be judged, to be condemned. It called him to return from that rubbish heap from which he had wandered away so that justice could be done." Close quote. In setting his tail in the Congo, where he had observed the effects of Belgian imperialism at first hand when he visited the country in 1890 to take command of a river steamer, Conrad was making use of a change he had himself undergone, arriving with the conviction that he was a civilized human being, he realized what in fact he had been. Quoting Conrad, before the Congo, I had, I was just a mere animal, close quote. <clears throat> the animal to which Conrad refers was European humanity, which caused the deaths of millions of human beings in the Congo. The idea that imperialism could be a force for human advance has long since fallen into disrepute, but the faith that was once attached to empire has not been renounced. Instead, it is spread everywhere. Even those who nominally follow more traditional creeds rely on a belief in the future for their mental composure. History may be a, a succession of absurdities tragedies and crimes, but everyone insists the future can still be better than anything in the past. To give up this hope would induce a state of despair like that which unhinged Kertz. Among the many benefits of faith and progress, the most important may be that it prevents too much self-knowledge. When Kayertz and his companion ventured into the Congo, the aliens they met were not the indigenous inhabitants, but themselves. Returning to Conrad, quote, they lived like blind men in a large room, aware only of what came in contact with them, and of that only imperfectly, but unable to see the general aspect of things. The river, the forest, all the great land throbbing with life were like a great emptiness. Things appeared and disappeared before their eyes in an unconnected and aimless kind of way. The river flowed through a void. Out of that void, at times, came canoes, and men with spears in their hands would suddenly crowd the yard of the station. Close quote. They cannot, meaning the white guys, uh cannot endure the silence 
into which they have come. Quoting Conrad, stretching away in all directions, surrounding the insignificant cleared spot of the trading post, immense forests hiding fateful complications of fantastic life, lay in the eloquent silence of mute greatness. Close quote. The sense of the progression of time which they had brought with them began to fall away. As Conrad writes towards the end of the story, quote, Those fellows, having engaged themselves to the company for six months, without having any idea of a month in particular and only a very faint notion of time in general, had been serving the cause of progress for upwards of two years, close quote. Removed from their habits, Kaertz and Carlier lose the abilities that are needed to go on living. Returning to Conrad, <clears throat> society, not from any tenderness, but because of its strange needs, had taken care of those two men, forbidding them all independent thought, all initiative, all departure from routine, and forbidding it under pain of death. They could live only on condition of being machines. Close quote. I mean, this was written in 1896, Conrad was writing this. Back to uh, John Gray. <clears throat> the machine-like condition of modern humans <clears throat> may seem a limitation. In fact, it is a condition for their survival. Kaertz and Carlier were able to function as individuals only because they had been shaped by society down to their innermost being. They were, quoting Conrad, two perfectly insignificant and incapable individuals <clears throat> whose existence is only rendered possible through the high organization of civilized crowds. Few men realize that their life, the very essence of their character, their capabilities, and their audacities are only the expression of their belief in the safety of their surroundings, the courage, the composure, the confidence, the emotions and principles, every great and every insignificant thought belongs not to the individual, but to the crowd, to the crowd that believes blindly in the irresistible force of its institutions and of its morals, in the power of the police and of its opinion." Close quote. <clears throat> Back to John Gray. When they stepped outside of their normal surroundings, otherwise when they stepped out of their comfort zone, when they let go of the bank and let the universe carry them along, when they stepped outside of their normal surroundings, the two men were powerless to act. <clears throat> More than that, they ceased to exist. For those who live inside a myth, it seems a self-evident fact. <clears throat> Human progress is a fact of this kind. <clears throat> if you accept it, you have a place in the grand march of humanity. Humankind is, of course, not marching anywhere. 
humanity is a fiction composed from billions of individuals for each of whom life is singular and final, but the myth of progress is extremely potent. When it loses its power, those who, those who have lived by it are, <coughs> as Conrad puts it, describing Kayerts and Carlier, quote, like those lifelong prisoners who liberated after many years do not know what use to make <coughs> of their freedoms, close quote. <coughs> Damn it. When faith in the future is taken from them, so is the image they have of themselves. If they then opt for death, it is because without that faith, you know, in the future, they can no longer make sense of living. When Kayertz decides to end his life, he does it by hanging himself on a cross. Returning to Conrad, <clears throat> Kayertz stood still. He looked upwards. The fog rolled low over his head. He looked around like a man who has lost his way, and he saw a dark smudge, a cross-shaped stain upon the shifting purity of the mist. As he began to stumble towards it, the station bell rang in a tumultuous peal, its answer to the impatient clamor of the steamer." Close quote. Just as the steamer is arriving, showing that civilization is still intact, Cares reaches the cross where he finds his redemption in death. What has the cross to do with progress? Conrad tells us that it had been put up by the director of the great trading company to mark the grave of the first of his agents, formerly an unsuccessful painter who, quote, had planned and watched the construction of his outpost of progress. The cross was much out of the perpendicular causing Carlier to squint whenever he passed it, so one day he replants it upright. <clears throat> In the story that the mock that's back to, uh, make sure you understand we're back to John Gray here. In the story that the modern world repeats to itself, the belief in progress is at odds with religion. In the dark ages of faith, there was no hope of any fundamental change in human life. With the arrival of modern science, a vista of improvement opened up. Increasing knowledge allowed humans to take control of their destiny. From being lost in the shadows, they could step out into the light. In fact, the idea of progress is not at odds with religion in the way this modern fairy tale suggests. <clears throat> Faith in progress is a late survival of early Christianity originating in the message of Jesus, a dissident Jewish prophet who announced the end of time. For the ancient Egyptians, as for the ancient Greeks, there was nothing new under the sun. Human history belongs in the cycles of the natural world. The same is true in Hinduism and Buddhism, Taoism and Shinto, and the older parts of the Hebrew Bible. By creating the expectation of a radical alteration in human affairs, Christianity the religion that St. Paul invented from Jesus' life and sayings founded the modern world. <clears throat> In practice, human beings continued to live much as they had always done. As Wallace Stevens wrote, quote, 
she hears upon that water without sand, without sound, a voice that cries, the tomb in Palestine is not the porch of spirits lingering, it is the grave of Jesus where he lay. We live in an old chaos of the sun. Close quote. <clears throat> Back to John Gray. It was not long before a literal expectation of the end was turned into a metaphor for a spiritual transformation, yet a change had taken place in what was hoped of the future. Many transmutations were needed before the Christian story could renew itself as the myth of progress, but from being a succession of cycles like the seasons, history came to be seen as a story of redemption and salvation, and in modern times, salvation became identified with the increase of knowledge and power, the myth that took Kertz and Carlier to the Congo. <clears throat> When Conrad used his experiences of the Congo and Heart of Darkness in 1899, he was not telling a story of barbarism in faraway places. The narrator tells the tale on a yacht moored in the Thames, est in the Thames estuary. Barbarism is not a primitive form of life. Con Conrad is intimating, but a pathological development of civilization. <clears throat> the same thought recurs in Conrad's The Secret Agent from 1907, his novel of terrorism and conspiracy, which is set in London. The Anarchist Professor we think of an anarchist professor. The anarchist professor who travels everywhere with a bomb in his coat that he tends to detonate if, if arrested wants to believe that humanity has been corrupted by government, an essentially criminal institution. But as Conrad understood, it is not only government that is tainted by criminality all human institutions, families, and churches, police forces, and anarchists are stained by crime, explaining human nastiness by reference to corrupt institutions leaves a question. Why are humans so attached to corruption clearly the answer is in the human animal itself. Conrad shows the professor struggling with this truth in this passage from, from uh, the secret agent. Quote, <clears throat> he was in a long straight street peopled by a mere fraction of an immense multitude but all around him on and on, even to the limits of the horizon hidden by the enormous piles of bricks, he felt the mass of mankind mighty in its numbers. They swarmed numerous like locusts, industrious like ants, thoughtless like a natural force pushing on, blind and orderly and absorbed, impervious to sentiment, to logic, to terror, too, perhaps." Close quote. The professor continues to dream of a future in which humans will be regenerated, but what he truly loves is destruction back to Conrad. The incorruptible professor walked, averting his eyes from the odious multitude. He had no future. He disdained it. He was a force. 
His thoughts caressed the images of ruin and destruction. He walked frail, insignificant, shabby, miserable, and terrible in the simplicity of his idea, calling madness and despair to the regeneration of the world. Close quote. If Kaertz hanged himself because he no longer believed in progress, the professor is ready to kill and die in order to show that he still has faith in the future. <clears throat> the myth of progress casts a glimmer of meaning into the lives of those who accept it. Kaertz Carlier and many like them did nothing that could be described as significant, but their faith in progress allowed their petty schemes to be to seem part of a grand design, while their miserable deaths achieved a kind of exemplary futility. Their lives had not possessed. <laughs> and uh, I probably shouldn't wind up there, but I want to read the first half of uh, this uh, other essay that had a particular attraction to me. You can uh, figure out why for yourself. This one is titled, Humanism and Flying Saucers. <clears throat> If belief in human rationality was a scientific theory, it would long since have been abandoned. A striking falsification can be found in a classic of social psychology. When Prophecy Fails, written in 1956, a study of a UFO cult in the early 1950s, Written by a team led by Leon Festinger, the psychologist who developed the idea of cognitive dissonance, the book recounts how a Michigan woman claimed to have received messages in automatic writing from alien intelligences on another planet announcing the end of the world which would be inundated by a great flood in the hours before dawn of December 21st, 1954. The woman and her disciples had left their homes, jobs, and partners and given away their possessions <clears throat> in order to be ready for the arrival of a flying saucer that would rescue them from the doomed planet. For Festinger and his colleagues, this was an opportunity to test the theory of cognitive dissonance. According to the theory, human beings do not deal with conflicting beliefs and perceptions by testing them against facts. They reduce the conflict by reinterpreting facts that challenge the beliefs to which they are most attached. As T.S. Eliot wrote in Burnt Norton, humankind cannot bear very much reality. In order to test their theory, the psychologists infiltrated themselves into the cult and observed their reaction when the apocalypse failed to occur. Just as their theory predicted, the cultists refused to accept that their system of beliefs was mistaken. Instead, they interpreted the failure of doomsday to arrive, you know, at a certain date. They interpreted the failure of doomsday to arrive as evidence that by waiting and praying throughout the night, they had succeeded in preventing it. The confounding of all their expectations only led them to cling more tightly to their faith 
and they went on to proselytize for their beliefs all the more fervently. As Festinger writes, summarizing this process, quote, Suppose an individual believes something with his whole heart. Suppose further that he has a commitment to this belief, that he has taken irrevocable actions because of it. Finally, suppose that he is presented with evidence, unequivocal and undeniable evidence, that his belief is wrong. What will happen? The individual will frequently emerge not only unshaken, but even more convinced of the truth of his beliefs than ever before. Indeed, he may even show a new fervor about convincing and converting other people to his view. Close quote. I think we're, we're, what we're doing, guys, is we're taking a peek into the year 2026. Anyway, <clears throat> denying reality in order to preserve a view of the world is not a practice confined to cults. Cognitive dissonance is the normal human condition. Messianic movements, is it messianic or messianic? I like the word messianic movements, whose followers live expecting the arrival of a savior, embody the dissonance in a pure form as Festinger, I don't want to hear any noise from the animals. As Festinger writes, quote, Ever since the crucifixion of Jesus, many Christians have hoped for the second coming of Christ, and movements predicting specific dates have not been rare. Messianic believers are convinced followers. They commit themselves by uprooting their lives. The second advent does not occur. And we note, Far from halting the movement, this disconfirmation gives it new life. Close quote. Apocalyptic movements need not be overtly religious, citing Festinger's work, the literary critic Frank Kermode observed that, quote, though for us the end has per perhaps lost its naive eminence, the shadow still lies on the crises of our fictions." Close quote. The shadow of apocalypse falls on many radical movements. Reproduced in secular form, apocalyptic myths possessed revolutionaries from the Jacobins to the Bolsheviks and beyond, inspiring movements as seemingly different as Trotskyism and late 20th century American neoconservatism, proletarian humanity in Soviet Russia, the Ubermensch in Nazi Germany, the global producer-consumer awaited by congregations of the rich at meetings of the World Economic Forum in Davos. Any of these versions of humanity would have marked something new in history. Happily, the end times failed to arrive and none of the phantoms materialized. If there is anything unique about the human animal, it is that it has the ability to grow knowledge at an accelerating rate while being chronically incapable of learning from experience. Science and technology are cumulative, whereas ethics and politics deal with recurring dilemmas. Whatever they are called, torture and slavery are universal evils, but these evils cannot be consigned to the past like redundant theories in science. 
they return under different names. Torture as enhanced interrogation techniques, <clears throat> slavery as human trafficking, any reduction in, hum in universal evils is an advance in civilization. But unlike scientific knowledge, the restraints of civilized life cannot be stored on a computer disk. They are habits of behavior which, once broken, are hard to mend. Civilization is natural for humans, but so is barbarism. The evidence of science and history is that humans are only ever partly and intermittently rational. But for modern humanists, the solution is simple. Human beings must, in the future, be more reasonable. These enthusiasts for reason have not noticed that the idea that humans may one day be more rational requires a greater leap of faith than anything in religion. Since it requires a miraculous breach in the order of things, the idea that Jesus returned from the dead is not as contrary to reason as the notion that human beings will, in the future, be different from how they have always been. <laughs> Amen, uh, Brother John Gray, and you can find more of this in the Silence of Animals on Progress and Other Modern Myths. But I need to wrap up uh, today's Doomsday Sermon and tomorrow's Chronicle of the Collapse. Uh, get out on this gloomy day and uh, continue beating the bushes for my little bivouac to survive the collapse of civilization and perhaps the apocalyptic end times. Bye, guys.